When I came back to miniature painting, there was this one thing, in good and bad, that everyone kept talking about. And that was the airbrush. And before I started painting miniatures again, I never in my wildest dream thought I'd ever have use for an airbrush. Yet, here I am. I have so much fun using one and I just can't imagine painting miniatures again without having that tool. Hey, I'm Emil and this is Squidmore Miniatures. You're probably watching this video because you have a general interest in either airbrushing or miniature painting. Throughout my time as a miniature painter, I've picked up quite a bunch of tips and tricks. And today we're going through some pointers on where to start using the airbrush. An important note, a lot of the things that I talk about in this video are my experiences and my opinions. You might have a different experience or maybe enjoy painting your miniatures in a different way and that's totally fine. What is most important is that you figure out what works for you and that you have a lot of fun while painting your miniatures. But we all know that I'm right. Today's topics are Why an airbrush? What you need to get started? Which airbrush should I buy? How to use an airbrush? Thinning your paints? Cleaning your airbrush? There are plenty of good reasons to pick up an airbrush. You can prime your miniatures in a winter's day. You can get super smooth transitions on large flat surfaces. It can speed up your painting process and it can even help you understand how light works. All of these are plenty good reasons to pick up an airbrush. But it's totally fine if you're just looking for a new tool to try out and make your hobby a bit more fun. So. What do you need to get started with an airbrush? The first thing is kind of self-explanatory, and that is, you need an airbrush. A compressor. You also need an air hose. You need water. Airbrush cleaner. You need a thinner or flow improver. You need paints. Q-tips, an interdental brush, and some cleaning tissue or regular paper. Which airbrush you should buy is one of the most subjective matters we're gonna discuss today. And you will hear some incredible painters swear by the 0.2 harder stain back airbrushes. And you will hear other equally good painters swear by the Badger 0.3 or 0.4 nozzle needle airbrush on the other side. And both of those are totally fine. And there are many good brands out there. Among the more exclusive airbrushes you have Iwata, you have Harder Steenback. You have some really good mid-tier ones like Badger or Sparmax. And even some decent no-name brands. And all of these airbrushes work, but we gotta figure out which one works for you. There are two things you always should look for when buying an airbrush for miniature painting. And these two things are constant no matter which brand you're looking to buy. The first one is that you want your airbrush to be a dual feed airbrush. What this means is that you control the flow of air and the flow of paint separately. And I will talk about this functionality a bit more later. And the second thing we talk about is how the paint is fed into your airbrush. You want something that's called gravity feed airbrush. What this means is pretty much that you have a cup on top of your airbrush and that the paint is fed by gravity down to the needle and nozzle in front of the airbrush. Hence it's called gravity feed airbrush. As a rule of thumb, when you're looking to buy an airbrush, you need to figure out if you're just looking to buy one to prime your miniatures and paint a base coat or if you're looking to buy something that gives you a bit more control that you can use for details and paint more advanced things with. And to figure that out, we need to talk a little bit about the nozzle needle size of the airbrushes. The smaller the needle nozzle size is, the smaller the spread of your paint will be through your airbrush. So if you're looking to paint large vehicles or prime a bunch of miniatures really fast, an airbrush with a little bit bigger needle is to recommend. This way you will get a large, nice flow and a bigger spread of your paint. 
With a larger needle nozzle you will also have less clogging and you won't have to thin your paints as much as you have to do with a smaller needle nozzle. But if you're looking to get into the nitty gritty details and maybe paint smaller details on smaller miniatures, an airbrush with a needle size of 0.2 or if you're feeling brave 0.15 is maybe the way to go. But these smaller needles and nozzles also put a bit more requirements on you as a painter because they're a bit harder to control. So if you're just starting out, my recommendation is to get an airbrush with a needle and nozzle size of 0.3, somewhere around up to 0.4. And anything in between there will work fine as well. This is a good starting point for painting miniatures. The nozzle isn't too small, uh, but it also gives you good control of your paint flow. And unless you're on a super strained budget, I recommend you to not buy the cheapest airbrush to start with. Although these do work, they are a bit harder to control. But if you ask me, I think struggling with your tool as a first thing when learning to airbrush is not a good place to start with. So my recommendation is to start with a mid-tier one so you can learn how to use it but still enjoying the process of learning. And also buying the most expensive airbrush is maybe not the best idea because the different parts of the airbrush are quite sensitive and it's really easy to break stuff. And you don't want to buy an expensive airbrush that's really hard to control for a beginner and very easy to break. So a mid-tier one like maybe the Sparmax, Max 3 or an Iwata Neo is a good place to start. And buying a compressor for your airbrush, that's a completely different story. I won't be going into the super technical differences between the cheapest compressors and the most expensive ones, but I'm going to give you some tips and tricks that I've picked up. You want to be able to control the pressure of your compressor. You want to be able to go from maybe 10 bars up to 40 bars and control the power between these. You also want your airbrush to be less than 50 decibels. And the reason for this is quite simple, because some airbrushes, they sound like an airplane. They're too loud and, and quite frankly, you will have a headache after using it for 10-20 minutes. My compressor is at 47 decibels and that's a quite decent volume. The sound doesn't shake the house, the kids don't wake up while I'm painting and it doesn't sound like an airplane. You can also get compressors that are down to below 40 decibels and these are incredibly quiet but they also cost a little bit more. You can also get a compressor with an air tank. And this means that the compressor will fill up your tank. It will load it with air when you start it up. It takes maybe 30 to 60 seconds for it to fill up. Then you can paint for a couple of minutes and it doesn't make any sound until it's almost empty and then it starts filling up again and makes sounds for 30 seconds. This is different from the cheaper ones because they will make sound as soon as you press the lever on the airbrush and that can be quite disturbing sometimes. But the tank, it's not something you really need unless you can afford it. The compressor that I use is probably the most common compressor on the market. It's called the AS186 and pretty much every airbrush brand and every hobby store has a different version of this one. It's one of these products that's like a standard product and everyone just slaps their logo on top of it, maybe makes different shelling on it, but it's the same compressor and it works the same. Just by checking on Amazon you can probably find four or five different brands that has the exact same compressor at a different price depending on which logo they slapped on it. And this compressor, I can totally vouch for it. Uh, I had nothing but good experiences with mine and it doesn't make too much noise and it has a consistent flow. In Sweden, it costs about $130, but in the US you can find them for $80, $90, somewhere around that range. And, and I put the link to all of these products in the description. The airbrush, the compressor, the thinner, the flow aid, etc. You can find it all in the description down below. So we touched on what to buy and what you need to use an airbrush. Now we're going to talk about how to use it. The airbrush pretty much has two functions. When you press the lever down, you get the air flowing. And when you put the lever back, you release the paint. And this is the order you do things when you use the airbrush. You start with air and then you spray the paint. And the more you pull the lever back, the more paint is released. This way you can control the amount of paint on your model. And as I mentioned, you always want to start and end your spraying with just air. Because if you stop pressing it down, stop spraying the air, but still release paint, there will be paint sitting in your nozzle, 
and this will probably dry sooner than later and cause it to clog up. And the reason you want to start with using just air and not paint is if you release paint first and then press down the air button, you will have paint lying in your nozzle and when you press down the air, it will spray out a splatter of paint on your beautiful miniature and probably ruin your paint job. So make sure to always start and end with air. You can also control the area which your airbrush is spraying the paint. If you move closer you have a smaller spread of the paint and if you move back your airbrush you have a bigger spread of the paint. The first time you're getting used to an airbrush a good idea is to paint some circles and some lines to practice your aim, your hand-eye coordination and also get a feel for the air pressure and the paint release. Just by doing this a couple of times on a piece of paper you will get a good feel for how the airbrush feels and how the spread is of the paint. So where do you start with the air pressure? My recommendation is to start around 20 psi or one and a half bar. But there are a couple of different factors that can cause you to have to change the pressure of air. When painting closer to your subject, 20 might be a bit too high, causing something called spider webbing. This spider webbing can be caused because of two reasons. Either because you have a too high air pressure, or maybe you release a bit too much paint in one go. So, you lowered your air pressure and you don't get spider webbing anymore, but you start getting something called speckling. This is because your paint isn't thin enough. Adding a few drops of water or thinner will solve this problem for you. And sometimes, instead of lowering your air pressure, you might have to increase it. If you're getting speckling even though you're spraying from a bit further away, and your dilution when you were spraying close to the miniature was perfect, but now you're painting a bit further away, so you might have to increase the pressure of the air again. Okay, okay, Emil, but wait, you talked about you have to thin your paints, wait. Thinning your paints, I touched on this subject just a few seconds ago, and thinning your paints might actually be one of the main keys to success when painting miniatures. You can do this in many different ways. Some people like to buy pre-thinned paints from Vallejo or Games Workshop. Others pre-thin their paints in bottles and have it ready when it's time to paint. Others do it in a cup when they start painting. My personal favorite ways of thinning and mixing my paints is to do it in the airbrush cup when I'm about to paint. This way I cut out all the extra steps for me to get started when painting and if you know me I just want to have fun when I paint so this is what works for me. I do this by adding a couple of drops of thinner or if you live in Sweden or a place with really good water you can just add a couple of drops of water into the cup of the airbrush. I start with the thinner or water because you don't want the paint to fall into the tube of the airbrush because it will be a lot harder to clean it later. I then add a few drops of paint into the cup I stir it around with a large old brush. You don't want to use your new expensive Raphael brush. You want to use a cheap one because this might mess up your brush a bit. And when I've mixed it up in the cup, I cover the nozzle of my airbrush. I move the lever back and down to create a backflow in the cup. This mixes the paint properly in my cup. And as I mentioned, it cuts me a couple of extra steps when painting and I don't have to buy hundreds of special airbrush paints that I'm just using for airbrushing. The right mix will vary from paint to paint, so you might have to try for yourself and experiment a bit what works for your paint. As a rule of thumb, you want your paint to have a consistency of skimmed milk. I don't know if that helps, but it's supposed to be watery and kind of run down from the edge of your cup, but not too thin and you just have to try it out and figure what works for you. And it takes a few times to get the hang off. Maybe you will clog your airbrush up a few times before you nail your perfect consistency, but it's totally worth it in the long run to learn how to mix the paints in the cup. So you bought an airbrush, you started it up, you mixed your paints and started airbrushing and now you need to clean it. Let's talk about something you should actually do before you start painting with your airbrush. I recommend you to pull the airbrush apart and see what all the parts are, where they fit and how your airbrush is constructed. Get a feel for which part goes where and what function they actually have on your airbrush. And why you should do this is because when you start painting, if you get a clog or when you start cleaning, you don't understand where the bits go, you're in a bit of a trouble. So getting a good feel for your airbrush will really help you in the long run again. And what this has to do with cleaning, we'll touch on that in a bit. 
And if you watched an airbrush video before, you've probably seen at least a couple of different ways of cleaning your airbrush and everyone swears by different ways of cleaning your airbrush. And most ways are totally fine, but now I'm going to share with you what I've learned, what I found works the best and what saves me the most time when painting, but keeps my airbrush at a high level and keeps it from breaking. So you're spraying with different paints and you want to clean it up a bit before adding the new paint. You pour the excess in your cup into a garbage bin or a container. You then take a bit of water into the cup, give it some backflow again as you did when you mix the paints. You empty the cup and spray out all the excess that's left in your nozzle. When I've done that I take some paper and clean the inside of the cup to remove all the paint that's in the cup. You then repeat this process again. You probably won't have to use the paper, but you add the water, you give it a backflow, you spray out the nozzle and you empty it. You might have to do this two or three times for all the paint to be removed from the cup and the inside of your airbrush. So when you don't see any paint in your cup when doing the backflow and you spray with your airbrush on a piece of paper and it's completely clear, you're all done. This is something you need to get a good routine of doing and if you get a good routine, it will be a super fast process and you can move from one paint to the other quickly without having to stop. And the better your airbrush hygiene is while painting, the longer your airbrush will last and you will have a more consistent result from it. And the next thing we need to discuss is when you're finished for the day. So what I do is I clean it up the way I did in between every paint. I then fill it with a bit of airbrush cleaner I then take a q-tip and dip it around in the cleaner in the cup and stir it around to clean the inside of the airbrush. I then spin it around the tip of the needle to clean the needle top. I then pull the lever back to pull the needle all the way into the airbrush. And then push the q-tip around to clean the nozzle and the air regulator of the airbrush. Make sure to do this properly, push it around, stir it around a bit, maybe push down the lever to get some backflow again. And you want to do this because you don't want any paint to be stuck between the nozzle and the air regulator. Press down the lever to push some air through the regulator and this way you remove any excess paints or, or any excess airbrush cleaner. And if you don't do this properly, you will have paint dried up in both your nozzle and your air regulator. And if you have that, you will either clog up your airbrush or get an uneven flow of air and your paint will become speckly, it will just ruin your miniatures. So make sure to have a good airbrush hygiene. It's one of the most important things when using an airbrush and getting a good routine for that because if you don't, you're gonna ruin your miniatures by having an uneven flow from your airbrush. And once in a while, this won't happen too often if you take care of your airbrush, but once in a while, your airbrush will clog up. Either you forgot some paints in it, or you didn't clean it properly, or maybe some of your paints had particles in it that's a bit too thick to spray out of your nozzle. And when this happens, you have to pull your airbrush apart again and clean it thoroughly. This is not something you should have to do every time you're using your airbrush, and pulling it apart and cleaning it too many times might create micro scratches and ruin your airbrush in the long run. It will lessen your performance quite quickly if you do this every day. So just do this when you really have to. I found that most of the times when I have a problem, it sits either in the needle, the nozzle or the air regulator. You remove the needle from the airbrush, take a bit of paper and soak it with a bit of airbrush cleaner. You then clean the needle by moving the paper in the direction of the needle. You don't want to go back and forth because it's super easy to destroy the tip of the needle. So just move it the same way as the air flows on the needle from the bottom and up. And this is also where we use the interdental brushes I talked about earlier. If you dip them in some airbrush cleaner, you can clean the inside of your nozzle and the air regulator. If you get an interdental brush made out of metal, be incredibly careful so you don't scratch the inside of the nozzle. And sometimes you find a lot of dried up paint in your nozzle. Then you might have to go in with the tip of your needle as well. Don't push your needle into the insides of the nozzle. Put it in gently into the center and then push the sides of the needle around to scrape off the paints inside the nozzle. You will feel quite instantly if you have dried up paint in your nozzle. Just make sure to scrape it off using the side of your needle, not the tip. And be incredibly careful when doing this because you don't want to damage the tip of your needle and have to buy a new needle. And when you scrape it off the sides of the nozzle, just push it through the tip of your nozzle and then take my Q-tip, dip it in some airbrush cleaner and then clean the inside of the cup and the inside of the airbrush. If this is not enough to solve your problems, using the interdental brushes going into the airbrush again and just pick it apart and clean every part this way. But these first steps should be way enough if you're taking care of your airbrush. 
These are just the beginning steps of your airbrush painting journey. And in the future, I will be doing another video using the airbrush. I'll be going more into detail. I will be showing you some tips and tricks uh, that I've learned through my time using an airbrush. So just uh, hit the subscribe button if you want to see that in the future. I also release new videos every week, so make sure to subscribe for hobby tips, painting tutorials, or just fun times with hobbies. Don't forget to like the video, leave a comment if you have any questions, share it with a friend if you have someone who might learn something from watching this video. And with that said guys, have a great day. Bye. Oh, I almost forgot. This video, by the way, is sponsored by my Patreon supporters. They are the main reasons why I can do these videos. And if you feel like you learned something from this video or maybe just had a bit of fun watching me do stuff with hobby, consider pledging a few dollars to help me run this channel and do these videos and create content for you. Thank you all Patreon supporters for supporting this channel. Special thanks to uh, this week's new 10 plus dollar supporters Timothy Renshaw and Neil Otter. Also once again a shout out to my top Patreon supporter Albin Ostrom.